averaging 50 meters or so, cover most of the state. So that's the, the bedrock substrate of the state, but at land surface, we have high ground in the central part of the state and the northeast, high ground in the southwest and southeast. And then in between, we have the Red River Valley covered with clay and draining to Canada, as well as the Minnesota River Valley joining the Mississippi and heading south. Um, but on top of bedrock, there are thick sediments up to well over 100 meters in places. The thickest sediments are in the north central part of the state, uh, but sediments are absent in the far northeast and southeast, which means you can really only see bedrock exposed uh, in the uh, northeast and southeast, and of course, to a degree, in the Twin Cities. So these call the extensive bedrock outcrop is shown in pink discontinuous bedrock outcrop in green, and the rest of the state is thickly mantled by mostly glacial sediments. And so those glacial sediments largely consist of till here shown in green, and uh, the till in the state can be zoned as to whether it was carried from the Red River Valley by a lobe of the continental ice sheet, therefore it's rich in limestone in those areas, whereas the superior lobe carried sediments largely from the Lake Superior Basin. This is where agate hunters will find agate, and that's where sand and gravel users will find limestone-free sand and gravel. So that's just a quick warm-up uh, the, of the geology of the state. Our role is to map that geology. We never map more detailed than one to 24,000. These days, we don't map more detailed than one to 100,000. It's our job to provide the, the broad regional context Many of you may find our work uh, useful if you're new to an area, giving you the broad context, but of course you folks work uh, at site scale, more detailed, and, and we are, uh, do the government job of the regional context. We were launched on that mandate in 1872 when the legislature directed the university to organize a geological and natural history survey to um, present it as maps and reports transmitted widely to the public and to the legislature. And we're still doing it uh, because mapping needs to be done and redone as technology changes, science changing, changes, access changes and all. So we're involved in research, but that's not our primary role. Research is conceptual. Mapping is spatial, that's our niche. Monitoring is temporal. Research, mapping and monitoring come together in modeling such as groundwater modeling, and it's that 4D modeling that informs management interventions and that leads to societal benefits. So our niche is to do the, the statewide mapping while many of you folks do the site scale mapping. So <clears throat> formal published documentation of our geology really got started with Father Hennepin sketching the uh, St. Anthony Falls in the 1600s. And uh, 200 years later, the first director of the Minnesota Geological Survey used his maps to calculate the rate of retreat of St. Anthony Falls, and that was the a basis for the duration of post-glacial time. But that's an example of how the knowledge that has been built by the people of the state for 10,000 years uh, and more uh, came to be more formally documented in published literature. So from the early scientific explorers to our first director, our job has been to document the geology of the state for the benefit of the people, whether it's used for engineering design or water supply or energy or minerals or, or dealing with hazards such as slope stability. So our first, profess, first director as the geological survey was Professor Winchell, uh, Governor Dayton's uncle. Uh, he was appointed in 1872. He produced the first uh, formal bedrock geology map of the state in 1872. And in the year 1900, he produced his final report. So the legislature laid him off and shut down the institution. And those of you who are consultants uh, will not raise your eyes, be, eyebrows because when the job is done, you're done. Uh, and so we were shut down for 11 years, but then it was recognized in 1911 that the job would be ongoing. But you can read the fine print here, Geological and Natural History Survey of Minnesota. The natural history part of our mandate became the Bell Museum. They, of course, have their new, new building in St. Paul. But if you would like to read about Professor Winchell, I urge you to purchase 
uh, this book published this year, uh, published by the University of Minnesota Press on Professor Winchell. I think you'll find it to be a very enjoyable uh, and informative read. So after Professor Winchell, Governor Dayton's uncle, did his thing in the late 1800s and after we were shut down for 11 years, we were restarted under Professor Emmons as the Minnesota Geological Survey in 1911 and subsequent directors, Grout, um, Schwartz, Sims, Walton, uh, Grew, Southwick, and then I followed. Uh, I was recruited from the Geological Survey of Canada in the year 2003. So we moved into Pillsbury Hall in the year 1890, and oh my goodness, I'm still recovering from my exhaustion, having cleaned out the sub-basement of Pillsbury Hall as the final job in clearing out of Pillsbury Hall. Uh, we moved out of Pillsbury Hall last year, it's undergoing renovation now, uh, but Earth Sciences, the geology department, uh, now happily resides in Tate Hall, I bet some of you had took classes in Tate Hall and Pillsbury Hall, uh, but uh, Pillsbury is now being re renovated for English and the survey as I'll described is now located in St. Paul. So we were in Pillsbury Hall up until the 1970s, then we moved to Eustis. I bet some of you visited us there. We then moved to University Avenue and then in 2015, we moved to our location on Territorial Road, close to where 280 joins I-94. Please come visit us here anytime, especially when we're open. But these days, uh, one or two of us are, will be here. Just pound on the window if you need to get in here with your mask and all. So for most of our history, mining certainly was the dominant focus. But this century, the, the focus has been on water. Um, and this slide uh, basically emphasizes that even though we are a state of lakes and rivers, as most of you know, the majority of our drinking water comes from groundwater. And so in uh, over a decade ago, people became quite concerned about groundwater contamination, the Eastern Twin Cities Metro situation, for example, over pumping at various sites. And so in 2007, just as one example of what was happening back then, the Star Tribune I ran an editorial calling for multiple steps to restore confidence in our drinking water. And one thing that was mentioned was enhanced funding to the State Geological Survey, because we're, we're the agency whose job is to image the subsurface, just like radiology at the hospital. They use x-rays, CAT scans, ultrasounds, and MRIs. You folks uh, use your methods, and we have our methods for looking at the imaging the subsurface of the entire state to support key issues like engineering design, pipeline routes, power line installations, but certainly groundwater management is our lead application. So a lot of work was done uh, starting in the uh, mid to late 2000s. For example, the statewide conservation report was produced and, and it called for layered geological mapping. You know, we don't wanna be managing groundwater blind. We need mapping, so this report called for systematic geological mapping. Um, multiple reports looked at surface water, multiple reports looked at groundwater. These planning efforts were very well coordinated, beautifully done. This culminated with the 2011 uh, water sustainability framework. More has happened since then, that's for sure. But this report very, even more clearly called for us to accelerate our production of county geologic atlases. They called for a doubling of the pace and we're moving as swiftly as we can to produce those maps that guide regional groundwater management. So our job is to fill this map, a county geologic atlas for every county. We're moving swiftly, there's a lot happening. We're working in partnership with DNR Water, we're working in partnership with the health department to produce these maps. So paper maps are still important. We love them. However, you all know how things are changing. You want 3D, you want layered information, you want seamless databases, you want things to work essentially the way Google Maps works. And so we're rapidly transitioning while continuing to publish paper maps, we're rapidly transitioning to queryable, zoomable uh, 3D databases. So um, we are have multiple databases that are steadily being upgraded. Those databases are interpreted on an ongoing basis. We produce the paper maps that are layered more and more, but we have the three dat databases that accompany them. Whether you want the paper map of Hennepin County or want you, whether you want the 3D database, it's our job to 
produce what you need. So we are working with partners to fulfill these responsibilities assigned to us by legislative planning, two levels of resolution, multiple layers of geology. The mapping is meant to be comprehensive and applicable to water and other applications, whether it be engineering design uh, or other applications. We concurrently are undertaking funded basic research that is needed to optimize our mapping with an emphasis on enhanced hydrogeological characterization of sediment and rock strata. Um, and uh, we have multiple sources of funding from the legislature with tight deadlines and strict deliverables that, that we very much stay on top of as you all do. Um, and very strong support from, from the legislature. We're very happy to have close partnerships with uh, members of the legislature and with legislative panels that, that very much keep us focused and keep us on schedule. And there also are federal programs that we partner with. So in terms of how we assemble all this, the geological mapping is first published as authored in peer-reviewed paper maps. And then we tra transition that uh, data to seamless uh, databases. All publications have been scanned. So anything we've published since 1872 is downloadable, downloadable from the web for free. Uh, and you'll find all that on our website. Um, and as I've stressed, concurrent with publications, we are assembling those seamless two resolution databases such that you can infer properties below water and below soil mapping. And we want this to be as compatible as possible with our neighboring states and provinces. So your multi-state work isn't uh, uh, undermined by differences in terminology. Um, let's see uh, if I can read my script. If, no, so we are moving forward on our Precambrian geological mapping with the no new outcrop map. Uh, I'll actually return to this. We've updated our Paleozoic stratigraphic nomenclature in 2008. We increased our compatibility, for example, with the state of Wisconsin in our stratigraphic naming of Paleozoic sedimentary rocks. We did a major update of our quaternary stratigraphic naming a few years ago, um, and which simplified our naming and caused you to need to know fewer names because we've boiled it all down to be more consistent. And we are really evolving all of these things uh, at the two levels of resolution uh, to be more 3D, in other words, thickness indicated, while properties, heterogeneity, and uncertainty are gradually being better specified. Parsing of legends to facilitate queries is using broadly accepted, well-defined terminology and quantitative support to facilitate optimal inference of properties such as hydraulic conductivity. In the old days, you would read the paper report, but now more and more, you want a grid a 2D grid or a 3D grid of inferred properties such as hydraulic conductivity or boulder frequency or ease of excavation if you're interested in broad regional information. Our geological mapping includes much field work and new drilling. Uh, we work with multiple spatial databases, for example, the statewide LIDAR database that uh, uh, is, is something we use every day. A decade ago, we were a pioneer on the national scene with superb statewide LIDAR. Now our LIDAR has fallen behind. It doesn't meet the federal specifications or so people are scrambling to update LIDAR and I'm helping as I am able. We also coordinate with the DNR Drill Corps Library and Mineral Exploration Document Archive and the Bell Museum Fossil Collection and the DNR Aquifer Properties Database. So we hold uh, most of the statewide geological collections and databases and some reside at DNR or Bell Museum and we partner as required for those statewide collections and databases. So our geological <clears throat> databases include drill hole data, field observations, karst, sediment texture. The water well database is a major activity for us in partnership with the health department. We now have over 500,000 wells in the database. We improve this database every day uh, and, and we use it heavily. Our geological collections include cuttings, geochemical samples, rocks, thin sections. Um, the geophysical databases uh, are multiple. We had 
the best magnetic database in the country, we made it better. You can see the change in feature resolution. Uh, you can see in a national uh, assessment of magnetic databases, uh, you can see we have the greatest extent of level two, um, but we're constantly striving to improve those databases. Same thing with gravity. We had a very good gravity database, which allows us to interpret the deep rocks just like the mag. We made that gravity database much better. So we're constantly improving these databases. Borehole geophysical surveys are something that we do a lot of. We do a lot of gamma logs and we appreciate help, perhaps from many of you in arranging for this data collection. We've broadened to multi-parameter caliper, EM flow meter and borehole video. Uh, in terms of soundings, increasingly we are using passive seismic. This little gizmo gives us depth of bedrock plus or minus 20%. Most of the time, it's not perfect, but if you uh, uh, collect enough data in a very inexpensive and quick way, you get a picture, especially of, for example, where does a buried valley go? You don't need, uh, if you know that the buried valley is there, you just need to know where it goes. Passive seismic uh, gives you that answer quickly. We also have worked with partners uh, such as the PCA and DNR and USGS to build statewide geochemical databases. We were heavily involved in the design of the National Soil Geochemical Survey and I was heavily involved. And we have the only jurisdiction-wide published multiple commodity indicator mineral survey that I'm aware of in the world. Um, so we, the new one to 500,000 mapping uh, provides context and supports statewide analyses. The bedrock map is layered, as I've mentioned, and just this year, we finished work on Precambrian layers. This is the draft of our new basement map, which shows the Precambrian rocks after we remove the Duluth complex, the Anemone cover, the Sioux quartzite, and the Mesoproterozoic sedimentary basins. So that's a first for the state to have a basement geological map that was released during the summer, along with the ge Precambrian geochronology, outcrops, uh, structure, and the first iteration of our seamless detailed bedrock that will be more readily queryable than the paper maps. So staff on their own time, after hours, at their own expense, even turned our new bedrock geology map into a quilt. Uh, after the pandemic subsides, please go to the Wilson Library on the West Bank and see this map at the uh, map library. If, if you're lucky enough that it's on display when you go, it's a magnificent quilt that beautifully depicts the um, bedrock geology. So many of you probably know this map of our quaternary, the uh, sediment map published in 1982. We superseded it with a whole new legend in 2019. You can buy the paper map, it's cheaper than wallpaper, but of course it's the database that you most likely will use. We are uh, updating depth to bedrock on about an annual basis and we filled in this gap where few drill holes go to bedrock with a systematic survey uh, using passive seismic that was just finished about six months ago. So uh, we're working on yet another update on statewide depth to bedrock right now. So we, most of our geological mapping now is done on a county basis. We used to work more on a quadrangle basis, but now we publish counties, which average about 50 kilometers by 50 kilometers. Uh, and we're producing that array of products that I'm uh, uh, emphasizing. Um, and we're very much working in 3D. We need to be able to see the drill hole data on a queryable basis to work with it in 3D. We interpret geology uh, by geostatistics, but also we draw cross sections. And this is being done at two levels of resolution with one kilometer cross sections and five kilometer cross sections. And we're also using geostatistics. So here's an example of an exercise in use of geostatistics where we're inferring uh, sand bodies directly from the drill hole data. We also work all with one kilometer cross sections on each county to reconstruct subsurface solids such as aquifers. And we're also building a, a statewide model using cross sections at a five kilometer spacing. Um, and here's an example of the central part of the state. We'll have this all finished up in uh, 2023, 2024. Uh, and we're working on ways to translate that 3D work into something queryable, such as synthetic drill holes uh, at a spacing equal to the spacing between the cross sections. 
but this needs to be brought together for the paper maps because many of us still use paper maps and so we produce the sand models on a, an atlas plate like this. So uh, just from an institutional point of view, we are uh, operating on about 3 million per year. Uh, we have a staff uh, usually in the high 30s. Um, we have produced documentation to support use of the geological atlases, regularly updated, most recently last year. Um, again, this reiterates the multiple paper maps that we produce with DNR for the county geologic atlases and uh, the concurrent work to directly support, especially aquifer property characterization. And there's one of those brown envelopes that's still our bread and butter, but uh, the databases, of course, are rising. Uh, we spend about a half million dollars per county to produce each county geologic atlas, and uh, we'll have those complete statewide within a few years. So now just put in the broader context, we're a federal nation, just like Australia, Germany, Canada. We have the Federal Geological Survey. We have state geological surveys. We partner very happily with the US Geological Survey. I'm a past president of AASG, the Association of American State Geologists. Funding to state geological surveys is at an all time high. Uh, total funding to state geological surveys is now a quarter billion per year, while USGS receives uh, well over a billion per year. Um, and we get a, a base uh, budget of about a million a year directly from the legislature and the rest is project based. If you looked at, look at the financial model for every state geological survey, you'll see that we're quite unusual. We're on a short leash with non-recurring state appropriation that will be very familiar with most of you working on a project basis where there's no automatic renewal. And so we're on a short leash from the legislature and that's just as well. So I've mentioned our partnership with DNR Water, with the Health Department. We have multiple partnerships with state government agencies. I'll now highlight our close partnership with DNR Minerals. DNR has a magnificent facility in Hibbing. As some of you know, the Drill Core Library has grown building by building. It's an incredibly important resource, this library of geological materials which is used heavily, tremendously important for many people. Core Scan was there last year, a very exciting high-tech project to image core. And uh, our 60,000 precious rocks are stored there, but now it's time for a new building. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of core coming in, especially from polymet and twin metals. And so that uh, we expect that new building will likely be in the next bonding bill. It needs to be, because this is urgently needed. It was not in the recently signed bonding bill, but a lot of work is, is going on. It's my job to emphasize that these drill cores are a treasure and they are needed in the future. Um, and now, ever so briefly at the end, national and international coordination. I worked hard on the National Geospatial Advisory Committee. I represented all geology in the US. There was one person from Google, one person from ESRI, for example, OpenStreetMap. So this is, this is the Federal Advisory Committee that advises on all mapping nationwide. So we, all, we state geologists are very active in DC. The National Geologic Mapping Act governs uh, the geological mapping that we do. Um, and the act authorizes the National Geologic Map Database led by Dave Soller. And I have done a lot of work supporting Dave Soller on the standards and on the databases. Oops. Yes, we still focus on publications, but more and more, you want seamless. You want that database just like Google Maps. Uh, and you want 3D, the most advanced state or provincial geological survey in North America is Alberta. Their 3D program is led by my former student and this is what you want, something that you can apply directly to your modeling. France has a nice national model and we're making progress in that direction. We're learning a lot from soil mapping. Uh, they're ahead of us, they're very good at this, we're learning from them. So we really respect the leadership of soil mapping. And we need these databases for groundwater management, engineering, and other applications at the site scale and at the national scale. Uh, the national water model is good, but it's missing groundwater. Uh, well, it's starting to include groundwater, but we need geology such that we can 
whether we want to model earthquake propagation or groundwater, we need these resources. So we work as publications, standards, databases. National Geologic Map Database Phase 3 is the database. You can see it was supposed to be up and running in about 2008. Well, last year it was still not running. We were a decade behind. So what does it take? It does take coordination. We have hosted a new conference, the Geologic Mapping Forum for two years. We had a beautiful conference all ready to go last April. It of course was canceled, uh, but uh, the appro federal appropriation was level, but you can see something changed last year, a $10 million increase uh, for FY20. That was again in the house mark last July and yesterday the Senate released their draft budget bills in DC and that $10 million increase is in there in the Senate bill. However, the leadership that was required to get that $10 million increase to launch phase three, to launch a national program of seamless geological databases, the leadership came from Betty McCollum. Betty McCollum works very hard to protect water to do what we need to do to protect our water. She understands that on the national scale, on the regional scale, we need geological mapping to inform groundwater management, groundwater protection. And so I've been working very hard to support Betty in her leadership that is changing fundamental aspects of these information systems that the people of the nation required. So finally, on the international level, again, this is all about publications, standards, and databases. On the international level, Publications are led by the Commission for the Geological Map of the World. If our meetings in India last March hadn't been canceled, I would have represented North America at these meetings of the CGMW. Uh, standards are led by CGI. Here we are having lunch in Madrid last year, uh, and I was elected chair of CGI on the international level a month ago. And databases are coordinated by One Geology. I was on the organizing committee for One Geology a decade ago, and you can see tall people always have to stand at the back. So these were our One Geology meetings in Vancouver last year. So in summary, strong support from the Minnesota legislature has allowed the Minnesota Geological Survey to grow and to focus on the actual needs of the people statewide. Concurrently, very helpful roles are being played by programs such as the USGS Great Lakes Geologic Mapping Coalition and the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program. But most important, we request, we welcome discussion and advice. You, everyone here today is in a position to advise us, to urge us, to, to do what we need to do. And we, as always, look forward to be guided by your advice. In closing, I wanna say how much I appreciate this opportunity to speak. And whether it's now or in the future, I look forward to being guided by your wisdom. Thanks.